I've been a nurse in tissue viability for many years, um, approaching over a quarter of a century now. And one of the things that strikes me is we have a great ability to spin to each other. And we have a great ability to get ourselves worked up about stuff which is, is not massively relevant and miss the big stuff. And I think one of the issues that um, a lot of us have been talking about during the pressure ulcer, uh, pressure ulcer campaigns has been that that's very important, but actually these patients with leg ulcers who are actually also important and our focus has been switched somewhat. So at Heologix, we, we run a, a number of different clinics. And <coughs> what I'd like to talk about is, is lower limb wounds, uh, the pathways that we use. And this is a title which was thrown out there um, eh, because we didn't know what the data was going to say when we looked at it. So we made an assumption that it would be roughly 90% healing in 120 days. And that's a really good example of how you can obfuscate <coughs> by throwing in words and putting them together. Because that sounds really impressive, but what is it? 90% of what? 90% of everyone who was referred to us, 90% of the people who finished treatment. And what does 120 days mean? What does that mean for other people? So what I'm going to try and do now is, is take a very labored approach to go through our data and hopefully explain that we have a bunch of numbers that mean something to our service, that mean that we know where we need to improve, how we need to advance. But nationally, we don't really have a conversation with each other about what healing means and, and what's an endpoint. We have a lot of talk about biofilms. We have a lot of talk about new compression methods. But what we don't have, in my opinion, is a context into which we can fit those developments um, and understand their effic efficacy. So what I'm going to talk about is 2,442 patients that we've seen between 2013 and 2018. And this is to our service, which covers Crawley Horse and Mid-Sussex. Um, it started off as a venous leg ulcer service. I want to consider how healing rates can be presented in a meaningful manner. There was a suggestion some time ago I saw from a, a wound biologist in uh, Holland, and he said he, he thought the only way that one could um, get healed of a wound was to submit oneself to being as part of a poster presentation at a national conference, because it seems that everyone who gets in there heals. And as I've just heard from Tracy, there's a whole bunch of other people who are not healing. So what I think we need to do is to start thinking about what healing rates are and how they can be presented in a meaningful manner and take some lessons, dare I say it, from the medical community who seem to have got this, this down to a T. I want to look at some selected literature which is going to explain some of the points I want to talk about um, uh, and just consider how, how, how our data might impact on other services. This is Crawley Horsham in Mid-Sussex. Um, uh, we have one main wound healing centre, um, which you can see on the right-hand side there with three clinical rooms and an admin centre. We have six satellite centres um, where we have one clinic room in, in a, a GP practice. We're staffed by nurse specialists and band three healthcare support workers. And we have a, a le led by a nurse consultant. And the importance, it's really interesting listening to Jocelyn's presentation, the importance of the team leader actually feeds through in some of our data. Because at one stage in Q1 2017, we lose our team leader for a short period and then we have to replace them. And you see what the impact of that is on outcomes for patients. We're all familiar with the work of Julian Guest. And the truth is that what he found was a national scandal. And it's just kind of moved on. We've just moved on. It is a national scandal that 47% of the people he looked at, and this ran into tens of thousands of patients, had not healed within 12 months. Because as I'll discuss, Christine Moffat identified back in 1992 how we can use community clinics for leg ulcers to get 67% healing at 12 weeks and 81% at 24 weeks. That's a fantastic paper. And it's often misquoted um, eh, because what people will say is that Christine Moffat showed that you can heal venous leg ulcers in 12 weeks and then we set ourselves a standard which is actually not what she found at all. But that's a brilliant piece of work and it's a brilliant piece of work that we collectively as a field ignored because we didn't invest in our specialists to help move this forward. So one of our colleagues here, um, Dr. Ennis, he, he's taken data from 800 wound healing centers in America. And as you can see, he throws up another curveball because he looked at just over a quarter of a million patients. And he's saying that 117,000 of those patients 
who had, who had all their wounds healed, that gave a healing rate of 60.2%. However, if we looked at the wound level, he found of that just under half a million wounds um, healed out of the 667,000, giving a healing rate of 74.6. So that shows that within the same data set, depending on how you measure it, how you choose to interpret it, you can give yourself a different um, result. And I often think that if we had national data for pressure ulcers, we'd probably find that 25% of them happened in acute care, 25% of them happened in primary care, and the other 50% happened somewhere else. Because we've got committees that work out that wasn't our fault. And that, when we go forward with leg ulcers, that's what we should be avoiding. We should be owning the outcomes that are associated with our care that we deliver and owning the response. Now, I'm an old fella. Um, uh, someone commented on the beard recently and said it made me even look older, so that's fine. Um, I can live with that. But these folks here, you may not, you, well, you won't have heard of them. Zygmunt Kurkowski and Norman Matheson. These were the two surgeons. When I was a boy of 17, I went to work in an operating theater in Aberdeen. And that was my job as a nursing auxiliary until I became, got to do nurse training. And I know that this computerized audit was um, massive stacks of paper that was concertina paper. And as the young boy, I was called the boy of the theater, I would be sent and they would shout out, it was a clean, dirty, um, I'd some kind of procedure. And I would then go through the paper and tell them it was 4-0 proline. I went to the Far East to give a presentation about 1999 and someone noted I was from Aberdeen and he quoted this paper and he said, this was a turning point for surgeons when they actually acknowledged that there were surgical site infections. He said, that's the first, the first two guys who ever came out and said, here it is. Throw the dice, here's our data, this is what happens to our infected patients. And it's really interesting that if we look at how surgical site infection has moved on, honesty has become the policy. Now, if we think back to 1988, what else has changed? Well, that was the year of the Piper Alpha disaster. And the Piper Alpha disaster killed 167 people in the North Sea. It's kind of forgotten. It has its 30th anniversary coming up on the 6th of July. One of the parks I take the dogs to has a big memorial to those people. I was a student nurse back in theater placement the day that happened. So there we were taking people, there were very, very few survivors, but those who survived were coming in on helicopters into Aberdeen. And they had a burns unit. Well, fast forward 30 years, people did the surveys, Jackie Edwards did the surveys, they worked out that that's not a good idea, having lots and lots of people looking after burns. You get a far better healing rate and survival rate if you bring them in to specialist centers. And I was out on a, a British council trip uh, through the Birmingham City University to Vietnam um, at the beginning of, um, uh, at the end of last year. And I was accompanying Steve Jeffrey from the, the burns unit in Birmingham. And it was really interesting. He said, you know, he's got the busiest unit he's part of at 800 burns a year. And the healing rates and the survival rates are far improved. Now we've moved to that point. Similarly, these guys were operating the day after Piper Alpha. And I was there in my whites ready to go. And the list stayed the same. And Matheson commented, wasn't that part of the tragedy that we didn't have to cancel the general list because so few people survived? But that general list had a mastectomy, varicose veins, inguinal hernias, um, a colorectal surgery, and a vasectomy. Because in those days, general surgeons did it all, and you had to be good at everything. Fast forward 30 years, surgery is engaged. It identifies that you get the best results when people do a small number of procedures and they are expert at those. So the medical field in those 30 years has really learned something. Four years after this paper, Christy Moffat came along and told us we can heal leg ulcers really quickly by comparison to generalist care by using specialist practice. And I think it's fair to say that in some parts of the UK that has been adopted and there'll be some people in this room today who will say, well, I get better results than he's presenting there, and I salute you, well done. There'll be other people who'll sit and say, I don't have a clue what my results are. And I've sat here with this gentleman, now retired, as a commissioner has said to a room of people, we want to look at leg ulcer results, and people have said, we get great results. And he said, I've never seen the data. They say, we haven't got it. How do you know you got good results then, mate? He's very calm. I was sitting there thinking, well, I would just tell him. So, what I want to draw your attention to is this number here, 2,442. If we say, okay, that's the number of patients who were referred to our service, do we give a percentage of those patients 
that left the service healed. Is that the correct way we should interpret this? Because it's a little bit more complicated. 379 were sent to us because the local surgeries identified they needed the expertise of the assessment, were happy to deliver the treatment. Nine patients declined treatment. 151 were sent to us, given an assessment and told, you need vascular and you need it now or you need dermatology, or you need rheumatology. So move those patients on. We don't keep and treat them and confuse activity with achievement, where, well, you keep coming back for appointments. We're not achieving anything, but we've got lots of activity to show for your time. And here, we, we're working to the Any Qualified Provider um, guidance that was, was given on, on this contract from the Department of Health, where patients are required after four weeks to be divided into pathway one, which is simple, pathway two, which is complex. To get admission to the pathway two of complex, you have to have one of four criteria. You've had the wound for a year or more, you've been non-concordant, you've had an infection, or you have some edema. The first three probably point towards poor care that you've had in the last year. They probably don't relate to um, your physiological challenges that you have. So we then end up, we move from 2442 to 1408 who are admitted for treatment. And now we need to track those patients forward and say, so what happened to those people? Well, they divided into two different groups. We started off with the venous leg ulcer contract, and then at the request of the general practitioners, we then opened up to take non-venous leg ulcer work. But interestingly, 68% of those patients, as I'll discuss, um, have lower limb wounds. So lower limb wounds, however you define them, are definitely the big challenge we have in primary care in the United Kingdom. I would say a lot of those uh, uh, enhanced patients, uh, watch yourself when you come, this, come to the south, get your insect repellent on, because the number of patients who were referred with insect bites actually blew me away, because it's clear that they had had these bites, they got infected, they hadn't been treated, and then they moved on to some other kind of ulceration. So, I appreciate it's early on the day and I'm flashing lots of data, because you could say, well, Gray, just tell us what happened to your venous leg ulcer patients but they divide into different categories. So I want to show you what those are. Um, so pathway one, these are the simple patients. What happens? Well, five of them are still on treatment because that's the thing about data, it's alive. When Dave Runcival, our great data expert back at Eastbourne, dropped this, it was still, there are still patients on the system. So we need to be able to account for every single patient who walked through our door. So we have 210 patients, five still being treated, gives us 205. Touch of the Carol Vordermans here. Um, at 205 patients means 189, we discharge them healed. So that's 92.2%. Five were not healed when they were discharged. Of course, I'm panicking. What happened to them? Well, they moved house. They moved on. Um, they were admitted to hospital. 11 were referred on. And those people are referred on to vascular surgery, dermatology. We are not making the progress we expect. We think this patient will benefit from more input. The others, others, because we don't have a silo to put people we don't heal, so we're not hiding anyone. Of the, the, the others, 43 of those patients, 26 are awaiting allocation, so they haven't reached their four weeks yet. They're still in the system, they're gonna be allocated. 17 are on a maintenance pathway. And you can see the maintenance pathway, they've come from simple or complex, and those are people for whom we cannot heal them at this moment in time. There are recognized barriers so what we're doing is we're holding on to those people with the agreement of the CCG to maintain them infection-free, to keep them in as much compression, but there are other challenges that are getting in the way. So you can see as we're working through this, it's not really that simple to say, yeah, we heal patients. We actually need to be able to explain how and in which way we heal them and what happens to patients we don't heal. So pathway two, these are the complex patients. 55 still in the system take that away, seven have died, we've got 451. 84.7% are healed, 11 have moved on, been discharged, not healed, and 58 have been referred on. That's over five years. So roughly speaking, 11 to 12 patients a year, we're coming in and we're saying you actually need vascular assessment or dermatology review. <clears throat> We can change the numbers again, because we look at these combined leg ulcer healing rates, and we can see that we have an average, average healing rate of 87%. But that's about how you count them. So we need to consider as a team, and I'll talk about the team shortly, what are the reasons for the 2.8% known healing? Well, we kind of understand those because people move on, their lives change and they go different places. But the 10.2% onward referral, we need to have the discussion with the commissioners about whether or not there's a fast track to duplex scanning. 
because what's happening is patients are going back from us, they're going to the GP, GP refers on, they sit in a waiting list, they then, the letter comes back to the GP, then they come back to us. Is there a way in which we can short circuit that to get these people moving on more quickly? So the enhanced service, again, more spreadsheets. So the enhanced service here, pathway one, you can see very simple patients, 68% um, are lower limbs, but we also have some pineal sinuses, um, some surgical wounds that have dehist. Um, nothing dramatic in pathway one. Pathway two, you can see 48 are being treated. So again, we're down at 91.9% .9 for healing there and referred on. Some of that's people being referred back to their surgeons who sent them to us in the first place. Now, this is what I call an Andrew Kingsley chart. This is the kind of thing that Andrew throws at you. But it's really important that we're able to attract, to track and be honest with ourselves as to what we are and are not achieving. So here you see the blue is pathway one. So those that remember the simple patients, we should be healing them faster. Orange is the complex patients, we should be taking longer to heal them. So you look at that chart and you think, okay, we're getting our pathway allocation right. We've got that right. However, I draw your attention to, I'm gonna walk along here. Q1, see here, the big blip. You take those out and our data looks an awful lot better because we get averages that get even better. But we're not massaging the data. What we're saying is just what Jocelyn pointed out. You lose a team leader, you lose a bit, you wobble a little bit, you bring on other peoples, um, a, another clinic closes, for, there's nothing to do with us and we inherit those patients. And the result is for three quarters, we're struggling to get back again, but we have got back. And I think that's about being honest um, uh, about what does the data look like? What's the truth? that it tells us, because if it turns out that here, this blue, blue's the biggest one and orange is the smallest, we've got this all wrong. And that's the key, because there are human beings at the end of this, we need to be sure we're getting it right. Similarly, you can see again, Q1 to Q3 in 2017, the time it's taking to heal these people. So it's really clear that we did get lots more chronic patients referred in at that point. But that's not a, that doesn't give us the right to change that and take it out and, our, and put together a committee and say, well, you know, someone else's fault. That's how it is. That's how long it took us. That's the truth. So what I want to do now is to show you that if, depending on where you stop the data wheel spinning, you can get different results. So the data that I've, I've, I've presented so far was taken off two weeks ago. That's what happened. Here, what you've got is a different set because if you want to express your healing rate, do we express it as the patients that we reviewed? So those are the patients that made it from the 2,442 down into 1,400. We reviewed them, they started treatment. In which case, we have 85% of those patients leave us healed. If we take that figure from the patients that we treated and they finished their treatment, then it goes to 97%. Our average appointments to get to that at 18, you can see the difference between pathway one, pathway two, average days in care. So these are the numbers that we as a team are gonna sit and look at because that's what drives us. Because I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm not that troubled about what your figures are like. What I'm worried about is the patients that come into our door and how do we treat them in the best way that we can. So these are our numbers that as a clinical management team and a wider organization, we're gonna reflect on that. This is how our team's structured. It's a very positive way for us to work. What we've got here are our clinical teams, roughly 30 people, um, give or take bank people. Some of them are here today. And these are folks who've come and joined us. They've been trained in tissue viability. Some have, some have taken knowledge with them. And it was really interesting. And I'm gonna be really interested at dinner tonight to hear what they thought about Jocelyn. Because I actually thought a lot of what she was saying exists within our clinic spaces. People, and I know Fiona Collins is, is really hot on this. Everyone has lunch together in the big room. And I, I picked that up from what Jocelyn said. So I hope these guys are happy teams, but they're definitely working very, very hard. We've got nurse consultants, brought in nurse consultants with usually 20, 25 years experience. We've got four of those in putting into telemedicine, lymphedema and wound care. We have patient services and administration, a really small ratio compared to other NHS providers. 
um, led by Fiona Fahey's patient services manager. And that's about the focus. That's where the focus is. It's not a backward-looking focus on what can we do about administration and counting beans. It's a front-facing focus which says patients are at the centre of our issue. And if you ever have a complaint or issue with our service, rest assured someone's going to respond within minutes and we're going to take it forward. Our senior management team, Fiona Collins is our operations director, and Fiona has in direct interfacing daily with our CCG. And that allows us, we've got six CCGs, it allows us the opportunity to have the communication. We recently had a, a scenario where we work to everyone else's formularies. And everyone else says their formula is the best. Every CCG, all six of them. And they're all different. And that's not my job to say that. Uh, my job is to say, okay, carry on. Julie Stanton, our Associate Clinical Director, is leading on all our education, long-standing experience of running lymphedema and wound services. Julie pointed out that we needed flatnet, otherwise these patients are bouncing back. They need flatnet, we don't, you don't have flatnet on the formulary, but they're bouncing back, so they're, they're going to come back into the service again. So we go through the formulary process, Julie's put together the paper, Fiona's presenting that paper, and the formulary committee agree, the medicines management committee agree. It's that kind of communication. I think it's very positive for us because what we're not doing is working through six layers in the hope that someone will take that up with the CCG and change things. So for us, the key is what we've presented here is the culmination of many, many people's work. People have come, people have gone. There are people who still work with us now. This is over five years, trials and tribulations, um, uh, that has gone along with that. But it's clear from our data we've been able to achieve a degree of consistency. Our results are consistent across that period. And the way we do that is by promoting a standardized documentation, nine-step plan, doing a documentation, documentation audits, moving to an electronic platform across 2018. We definitely subscribe to the, the Steve Jeffrey philosophy. If it's dead, it's coming out because it's not going to go back to life. So we'll de-slough as, 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 as quickly as possible. We use curatage, which is something we learned from our colleagues in the States. And if anyone's interested with my BCU um, badge on, I'll be up in the clinical skills zone demonstrating curatage of oranges and bananas, because I know you get referred plenty of those, but we couldn't find anyone who was willing to have their legs curatage. Um, and we check competencies, because again, I, I'm looking at my, my colleague, Professor Stephen Haynes, who, who put everyone through, everyone through a reg registered, recognized leg ulcer program. And then I met her and she had to close down two practice nurses that day because she said these people weren't competent. It's the competency checking which is absolutely vital. So that allows us all to reflect on our performance and see if we can improve it. And non-healing patients, if you're not on the healing trajectory, your case is going to be put to one side. Julie puts together the PowerPoints every month. And as a clinical team, we review those patients and bring all our knowledge together. So the focus is you have a leg ulcer, we want you out of here healed as quickly as possible because surprise, surprise, patients don't want to have leg ulcers. This is how the kind of stuff that we promote. So we're using flowcharts, decision makers, giving people backup, um, written and visual um, stimulation, having the right guidelines, giving people the education. Everyone's going through their four-day training program. Everyone's having their three-day training program on chronic edema, lymphedema. Everyone's having their competency checked. What we don't want is freestyling. Nobody wants freestyling within our organization, whereas, well, I really like this, or I had lunch with that person, I'm going to use that. That's not how we operate, because we need that standardization across all our centers. So final messages. Professor Moffat identified back in 1992 that specialist clinics deliver faster healing. Julian Guest's work suggests that we hadn't got that message on board. Julian Guest's work suggests that the value of specialist nursing is not recognized um, in our NHS at the moment across the whole country. Our data tends to support what Professor Moffat and colleagues found back in 92. And it's our belief that appropriately, tra appropriately trained nurses who are facilitated, and it goes really, dare I say it, brilliant program, um, development, um, but that's exactly what Jocelyn was talking about. Nurses who are supported and facilitated in an environment to give evidence-based care will result in better healed patients. And a lot of what Jocelyn talked about, I was making notes on things, well, well, we do that, we do that. And, I, and particularly that, the lunch, 
quick responses, patients have any issues, we have quick responses from patient services, we have an operations director, quick response. Julie, we have any challenges, detail oriented around clinical stuff. Julie's producing the papers within a day or two. Um, uh, so we really believe in the specialist model and I hope that more nurses will be given that opportunity in their organisations across the United Kingdom to develop these skills. And I think that where people advocate upskilling across the entire workforce, so we're all going to be able to do leg ulcers, and that's a great idea if you can deliver the evidence, because the evidence is really strong for specialist care. We need to see the evidence. We don't need a hashtag or a gimmick. We need strong evidence, because as we heard from Tracy, there's people's lives at the end of this, and people have to get it right if we can. So, in short, there is no secret sauce required to heal venous leg ulcers, in our opinion. There is no need to channel moonbeams from the sun. It is all about getting the basics right. Assess the person, get it right. Debride them of dead tissue because it's not coming back to life. Get them into as much compression as they can tolerate. Reassess to check you got it right and maintain continu continuity. Many of our colleagues here are sharing caseloads, one or two people. They're making sure that any twinges, any changes in the patient, they're being picked up when they come back in. We have confident, skilled, supported nurses providing adequate compression. This is a life changer. It's an absolute game changer. And what a fantastic way to be a nurse, because ultimately, when we chose to be nurses, it was to help people. And there's no better way to help someone than to take something which is, as we heard, smelly, painful, life-destroying, and heal it and let the patient go on with their life. Thank you very much.